So this is the last talk of this session, and um, it has a very cute title, uh, With or Without You, Programming with Effects um, Exclusion. And it's given by uh, Matthew Luzet. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is a joint work between Aarhus University and the University of Tübingen. Uh, I'd like to begin with a tour of some open source repositories on GitHub. And we'll start with this repository from Google. And what I'm most interested in here is documentation. Uh, so if we look at this uh, TypeScript example of code, it says the handler function must not throw any exceptions when called. We can take a look at another example here, libevent, which is an event notification library. Um, the documentation here says the callback must not call any function that modifies the event base, modifies any event in the event base, or that adds or removes any event to the event base. And doing so is unsupported and will lead to undefined behavior, likely to crashes. Decred is a cryptocurrency library uh, written in Go. And here we have more documentation that says it must not call any doc, uh, connection manager methods during iteration, or else it will result in a deadlock. And finally, uh, a Java example, logback is a, a logging framework. Um, and it says implementations must not close the underlying output stream, which is the responsibility of the owning appender. So it's not hard to see what the pattern is here. Uh, in each case, we have some criterion saying that we can't do something. Can't throw exceptions, can't call a certain function or class of functions, can't close something. Uh, and the, the consequences of this are catastrophic uh, for our purposes. Um, we have undefined behavior, crashes, or deadlock. Uh, and to generalize what we have here, uh, it's something that we've called effect exclusion, which is a condition for correctness which excludes the execution of a particular effect. And our goal for this research is to enforce effect exclusion at compile time. Now, uh, effect systems already exist, and they're capable of doing this to some extent. Um, obviously, we can, uh, with an effect system, annotate a function with the empty set of effects, which will enforce that it is pure. It has no effects. And higher order functions can also do this. Uh, here we have an empty set in the parameter f, uh, saying that the parameter f must be a pure function having no effects. And going further, we can say that uh, a function has a single effect. Uh, here the say hello function writes to the console. That's its only effect. And so it has the console effect annotation. Uh, sufficiently abstract programs need some sense of uh, effect polymorphism. So this map function uh, is a standard function for mapping over a list. But here it has a, an effect uh, variable, which uh, is the same on the parameter f as on the uh, effect of the function as a whole, which means that the effect of the function as a whole is going to be the same as the effect of applying the function f once. Uh, and finally, we need this sense of uh, effect composition. Uh, if we're going to be combining two functions, then the resulting function needs to be a function uh, whose effect is the union, in some sense, uh, of the two component effects. So this is all possible with uh, most, programming, um, most effect systems today. Um, but it's actually not enough. Uh, and that's because there's a bit of a subtlety to our definition of effect exclusion. Uh, again, it's a condition for correctness which excludes the execution of a particular effect. Uh, but implicitly, what we're saying is that we want to allow every other effect. And that's not something that's possible simply with the unions of sets of effects. What we really want is something like this, effect subtraction. We want to be able to say that we can have any effect except a particular effect. Uh, and so that's what we have here. We have this no throw function, uh, which takes in a function f as a parameter. And the annotation on the function f is ef, some variable, minus throw. Uh, so that means that the function f can do anything at all except for having the throw effect. And so this is what we propose to have at the type level. And if we take a look at the body of this function, uh, we have a, a, a coordinating construct at the uh, term level. So here we have uh, something that does the same thing. 
uh, we call f on the empty set of arguments, uh, but we say that that execution is not allowed to have the throw effect. So we have this type level uh, effect subtraction, and we have this term level without construct. And we can see that in action uh, in a few examples. Uh, here, we want to avoid blocking the UI thread. Uh, and we want to avoid blocking the UI thread because that leads to freezes or other undesirable behavior. Um, and so this function on click, um, we want to ensure that the, uh, the listener that we register is not going to have the blocking effect. And so what we do is that in the body of on click, we define our function L. And in the body of the function L, we execute uh, the listener on some event E, but we require that that execution not have the block effect. And that means that when we try to execute on click uh, to register a listener, uh, in the first case, that's OK. Uh, we've registered it with the do uh, print line, uh, which just prints to the console, but it's not going to block, at least in our system. Uh, but in the second registry that we do there, on click, uh, on this lambda, which will read a line from the console, well, reading a line from the console is something that can block. So this is rejected by our type system. As another example, uh, we can avoid recursive event listener registration. So here we have another onClick function, uh, but we want to prevent this onClick function from registering other event listeners. Um, and to do that, we first associate with the onClick function uh, the effect of register. Uh, and that means that anytime we call onClick, we will have the register effect. But in the parameter f, we require that that parameter lack the register effect. Um, and so that means that any effect f or any function f that we give to the onClick function uh, itself could never possibly call onClick because calling onClick has the register effect, which is forbidden by the onClick function. And as a last example, uh, I'll invite you to think back to 2021 and pretend that you're a Java developer uh, who happens to be using log4j. Uh, you're probably worried right now. Uh, because log4j had this major vulnerability uh, where we were able to have uh, remote code execution through uh, networking and class loading. Um, but if you were happening to using a system uh, that had effect exclusion and that uh, effect system had networking and class loading as effects and you only need a, a simple logger that did the simple logging tasks that didn't need networking and class loading, uh, you could totally sidestep this issue, uh, the, this vulnerability, by declaring a safe logger, which lacks the network and class load effects. Uh, I'll take a look now at the formalism. Uh, we've defined uh, the lambda complement calculus uh, as a simple lambda calculus augmented with a without expression, the same without expression we saw before. Uh, we have an abstract machine which executes the calculus, and we have a type and effect system uh, which uses set formula-based effects. Uh, and we have uh, Hindenmilner type inference uh, using Boolean unification. The syntax of our language looks like this. Uh, most of it is uh, standard. The two important parts are the do expression, which is what executes uh, an effect f, and the without expression, which is what forbids an effect f from occurring. The abstract machine that we use uh, has two components. First, the expression E that we're working on, and then a stack K. And that stack is made of frames, which are either uh, let bindings or these without frames. And so a, a stack K can look something like this, where we have a bunch of let bindings and then these without frames. And from this stack, we can get our list of what's forbidden by the context um, by just looking at the list of uh, frames that are uh, all the without frames, we look at the effects that are forbidden there, and we get our forbidden effects set. Those semantics of our system, we can divide into three groups. The first group uh, are those that do not modify the stack, uh, and they include the standard uh, rules for definitions and lambdas, where we simply substitute in the, uh, the body of the lambda, uh, the, the variable in the body of the lambda. Um, but the do expression is more interesting. Um, here is where we actually uh, enforce the effect exclusion. Here we're trying to execute the effect f, um, and in order to execute the effect f, we require that that f uh, not be forbidden by the context. 
Uh, and if it is forbidden by the context, then we cannot advance. Uh, of course, we also want to push these frames onto our stack. So when we encounter a without expression, we push it onto our stack, uh, and same with a let expression. And once we've arrived at a value in our machine, then we can pop things off of the stack. Uh, so here I'll go through a quick example. Uh, this is the same onClick function that we saw before, where we forbid blocking in the listener. Uh, and we apply that to a function which clearly just blocks immediately. Uh, after a bit of substitution, we can start with this as our abstract machine. Uh, it's just the, the body of the onClick, or the definition of the onClick function applied to that lambda that blocks with the empty stack. Um, we perform a reduction by one step, uh, substitute in the lambda for the listener, and we end up with this. Uh, we now have a without expression, so we push that onto our stack. Uh, and now we just have a simple lambda application again, which we perform. Uh, and now we're at the point where we're trying to perform the block effect. But that block effect is clearly forbidden uh, by our stack here. And so we cannot advance any further. We've gotten stuck. Of course, we never actually want to get stuck, and that's why we have a type and effect system. Uh, and so the syntax of our system looks like this. We, our, our types consist of uh, variables, constants, and arrow types, where the arrow types are uh, labeled with their effect. And then the effects uh, consist of these sets. So we have variables, the empty set, singletons, uh, and then set complement, set union, and set intersection. And of course, because we're primarily interested in subtraction, we have this uh, syntactic sugar for subtraction. And finally, we have this notion of Boolean equivalence. Um, because any set formula can be expressed in any infinite number of ways, uh, we, we have this idea of uh, equivalence that just says that all these ways of expressing the same set indeed are equivalent. And with this, I'll present a few of the type rules. Um, here we have the uh, do expression. Um, the, the rule is very straightforward. Uh, when we're trying to execute the effect f, the inferred effect for that uh, expression is the, the set of effects with f in it. The without expression also is kind of what you would expect. Uh, we infer the, the effect of our sub-expression e, and then we require that that uh, effect lack the f effect that we are forbidding. And finally, the Boolean equivalence rule says that if we uh, have effects or types that are uh, Boolean equivalent, then they are substitutable with each other. So our system has the standard properties of progress and preservation, and it also has the property of effect safety. And our formulation of effect safety is slightly different from the standard one for effect systems. And that's because most effect systems are interested in being sure that uh, whatever F, whatever effect we're executing is a member of this allowed set of effects. But we're interested in the opposite. We're interested in making sure that the effect we are executing is not a member of the forbidden set of effects. And so it's a, a complementary idea, but the proof ends up being approximately the same. We've implemented our system as an extension to the programming language Flix. Um, it's written in about 10,000 lines of code, uh, and we support uh, this VS Code extension, which includes all of the, the IDE um, features, such as syntax highlighting and error reporting. We've evaluated our system in a case study uh, of 59 program fragments, for which we uh, as we saw before, they have some documentation uh, expressing exp effect exclusion, uh, but we've given them effect signa uh, type signatures uh, that will enforce the effect exclusion. And we've also uh, provided two proofs of concept, uh, two runnable example applications that demonstrate our uh, system in practice. Uh, for the case studies, uh, we first performed data collection, um, where we would look at uh, GitHub uh, code search, and we would search for terms such as must not call, must not throw, must not raise, things like that, that are expressing effect exclusion. Um, and we would get uh, a large uh, table of uh, examples that look like this. Um, uh, and I'd just like to read a couple of these to you, or just one. Uh, here, the MLDB AI system says uh, the job must not throw an exception, 
Any exception thrown within the, pro in the job will crash the program. And, and what we saw here is that not only are these things present in uh, a lot of code, they're also, it seems like the authors are very passionate about it. Uh, there are a lot of capital letters, a lot of exclamation points, uh, and in some cases, uh, some vague threats. And so this is nice because it really demonstrates that our, our system is not only present, or our system is not only uh, desirable, but also important to uh, some users. So anyway, uh, for each of these systems, we uh, took the original code uh, and took the documentation, and we translated that into a signature in the Flex language where the um, effect exclusion would be enforced. Uh, so here, the decred example that we saw at the beginning, we took that must not call connection manager methods uh, criterion, and we moved it into the signature. Uh, so here, the function f could never possibly uh, execute a use connection manager effect. Uh, so in addition to these case studies, we have a couple of proofs of concept. The first is a GUI library, which prevents blocking on the UI thread. Uh, and we have a, an event bus library, which will allow placing arbitrary restrictions on uh, the subscribers to the event bus. The GUI library um, looks very similar to the examples we saw before. Uh, we have this listen function, and in the body of the listen function, we require that the listener that we've registered uh, does not have the effect uh, block. Then when we uh, use this listen function, we can uh, give it a lambda that says print line because that's a non-blocking operation, but we cannot give it a, a lambda that says sleep because that would block, which is forbidden uh, by the effect system. Uh, the event bus library is a bit more interesting, uh, and that's because we have this type which is parameterized by an effect. Um, you see that we have this event bus uh, enum declaration, uh, and its first type parameter is an effect parameter. Uh, and that's the effect that, uh, of the function that is contained within the event bus. Uh, then we have these two functions, non-blocking and non-throwing, uh, which take in an event bus and enforce that that event bus uh, lacks the block or throw effect. And then the subscribe function requires that any function f that we subscribe to the event bus, uh, that the effect of that uh, function must be a subset of the effects allowed by the event bus. So you can see this in practice at the bottom. Uh, when we uh, create the event bus, we declare it to be non-blocking. And again, we're able to subscribe a function that prints a line because that's non-blocking but we're not able to subscribe a function that sleeps because obviously that is a blocking operation. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we've shown effect exclusion as a desirable uh, behavior or, or criterion in a lot of um, uh, real world programs. And it's the forbidding of one effect while allowing all other effects. We formalized our system in the lambda complement calculus, uh, which has full uh, soundness and uh, effect safety with full type and effect inference. We've evaluated our implementation with 59 uh, programs recast uh, into Flix, uh, and we've provided two example applications which uh, show it in practice. Um, this is an extension to the programming language Flix, um, so it's not merged into the master branch of the uh, language, but uh, if you're interested in Flix, you can find it at flix.dev. Thank you. We have a lot of time for questions. Yes, please. Yeah, I wanted to ask about tail calls. Looking at your semantics, a term that appears under without is not in tail position. But if your type system can rule out any dynamic activity in your implementation, can I make an optimized tail call to a function under without? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, I want to ask about tail calls. Yes. So can I make an optimized tail call to uh, in a position that appears under without. So your tail call to F without block, is that call gonna be optimized by your implementation? Uh, so the, the without is effectively erased by the time it gets to the back end of the compiler. Okay. Um, so yes, it can be optimized. Let's take one question from there. Hi, um, so first off, I really appreciate the fact that you is have, the Mac uh, working? The, the fact that you have a user study uh, that 
something that should be present more in our kind of research. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Um, hmm? Oh, is it okay now? Yes. Is it okay. Uh, I really want to highlight the, the user study and say that I really appreciate uh, and that it should be more present in uh, our community. Um, can you talk a little bit about the inference part? How do you solve the Boolean uh, aspect of it, or the, the set aspect of it? And do you have subtyping for it? Sure. Uh, so the first question is regarding the inference, uh, how we resolve these Boolean uh, effect sets. Uh, so we use Boolean unification. Um, so we, these are uh, Boolean algebras. And so Boolean unification allows us to do this. And the nice thing about Boolean unification is that it gives rise to most general unifiers. Uh, and that works very nicely with uh, Hinley Milner. And the second question was regarding subtyping, I believe. Uh, so our system does not support subtyping. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting that you used Boolean unification. I have worked on a system with Boolean unification myself. So I was interested to see it. Um, one question I had was that in my experience, Boolean unification gives you most general unifiers, like you said, but it can also generate quite big and large expressions of Boolean uh, expressions that might be quite difficult to read. Uh, have, you, have you found this to be a problem? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, so in a lot of cases, the, the ultimate expression that it could be reduced down to is very simple. Um, but. <clears throat> But indeed, uh, it's a very tricky problem to reduce these. Uh, and when we get to more and more complex expressions, then we end up deep with these giant things that uh, end up being a problem. So it's a matter of future work. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask about your effects F, the capital Fs in your syntax. Is that some fixed range of effects? Or can you, uh, I don't know, declare new effects to expand capital F? And can you abstract over effects? Do you have effect polymorphism? But you did seem, in your syntax, you did seem to have, in your phi's, I think they were, you had these betas, which look like effect variables. But then I'm a bit worried about when you do the intersection between these things, you know, it might matter whether the variable has been instantiated yet or not. So it's a, just a collection of questions around whether effects are fixed or quantified. Sure. Uh, so the, the first question about whether uh, you have the, the universe of effects uh, uh, a priori, kind of. Uh, in the formalism, indeed, that is the case. Okay, so that's how you can do effect complement. It's respect to the implicit global set of effects. Is that right? Yes. So in the formalism, yes. Okay. However, in the implementation, uh, we assume an infinite universe of effects. Um, and so that we, when we have effect complement, um, it's saying it, with respect to this uh, infinite universe. So it's a cofinite um, set of effects. Doesn't that mean that the implementation doesn't correspond to the formalism? So that would be, you know, how do you know the implementation is right? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. The, in our view, it's a very small step um, between the two. Uh, it's true that they don't correspond exactly. Um, yeah, that's the okay. short answer to it. Uh, and the last part was about effect polymorphism whether you can quantify over effects. Yes, indeed, we do support effect polymorphism. Uh, so this Boolean unification has these, uh, includes variables. Uh, and so, yeah, um, part of the syntax is uh, having these uh, effects that are, uh, okay. uh, yeah, variables, yeah. We still have more time if you feel like taking more questions. Sure. Yeah. I'm right here, hey. Um, I would like to ask a bit about the effect exclusion. Uh, I'll try to wrap my head around here. So. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but if you, you could choose like row polymorphism as a basis for your effect type system, and if you go with the French school of thought, then there's a system by Didier Rumi called uh, where they use presence flex, and one of those presence instantiations is absence, so you can rule out particular um, effects from, from being raised. So my question is really, what is the um, comparison of relation to this type of system, and how is this different? So you. 
You're talking about rows of... So basically, it's called present flex. So you should either be present in a row, or it could be absent, or it could be polymorphic in your presence. And one of them is absence. It literally says, I'm not here, or you're not there. Um, and it seems very similar to what you, you're doing here. I'm just uh, trying to understand what the relation is. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not comfortable speculating on that right now, but maybe we can talk a bit afterward. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can extend on this question a bit. Yep. I think in general, like, there are some like, languages that model effect annotations using like, row types. And there is, of course, like, a very long history like, on row typing. And there is work on, like, for example, row concatenation and row subtraction. And there is also work on um, where there, like, the system wants to make sure like, a particular field does not uh, occur in a row type. Like, what's the general relation between like, the way you uh, did this work and how do you compare it with like, the systems like has these kind of features in their row typing, and maybe we can, we, use, uh, we can use that kind of system to model effect annotations. Uh, yeah, so I, I think it's very interesting, uh, but I, I'm not sure I quite am able to answer that right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's take one last question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm wondering a bit about the granularity of effects. So in, um, in, in your syntax, effects seem to be somewhat constant. And there was one, one example with this connection manager where the documentation said something like, you're not allowed to call uh, if, um, connection manager methods, and it seems to intend on this connection manager that passes a parameter. But your um, type specification seems to preclude any connection manager effects on any connection manager object whatsoever. This is true, and can you limit the effect or oh, the effect exclusion to the given connection manager? Yeah, so th this is a very good point, and this is uh, in some sense a weakness of our system. Uh, indeed, there are a lot of cases where uh, we want to exclude uh, only effects as they relate to a certain object or value, uh, and our system is not capable of uh, expressing that. Yeah, thank you. All right, that's the speaker again.